Today, I'm uh, really happy to have the chance to introduce Dr. Robert Hunt, who is our World Christianity Lecturer and uh, also an Adams Mission Lecturer. Uh, Dr. Hunt serves as the Director of Global Theological Education at the Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he lectures on world religions, Christian missions, interreligious dialogue, and Islam. Dr. Hunt has written several books, uh, particularly on Malaysian church history and works on Islam, including the following, Islam in Southeast Asia, Muslim Faith and Values, What Every Christian Should Know, and Muslim Citizens of the Globalized World. His most recent, recent book is called The Gospel Among the Nations, A Documentary History of Enculturation, which was published by Orbis Press. And this book won a second place award in the 2011 Catholic Book uh, Prize for Education. He has numerous articles in journals and reference works, and his current projects include a study of Christian identity in religiously plural contexts, and also a study on the relationship of Muslim identity to power sharing in secular societies. Uh, he has participated in diverse conferences on uh, Christian-Muslim dialogue in Malaysia, Indonesia, Austria, Macedonia, Spain, China, and the United States. He's lived and worked in Malaysia for several years, in Singapore for several years, in uh, Vienna for several years. He speaks Bahasa Malay, German, and his English isn't so bad either. Uh, Dr. Robert Hunt's campus visit is sponsored, as I mentioned before, by the World Christianity Lecture Series and by the Adams Mission Fund. So I'm uh, so happy that he's here. We are on a, a project together in Singapore, so we'll see each other again in November in that great country. But uh, welcome, uh, Robert. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me out here. This is my first time in Santa Barbara. Um, in my years in Asia, I flew in and out of LAX or San Francisco International dozens and dozens of times and never actually got out of the airport. Um, this year has been, in fact, the first time that I've visited California at all. And I've, it's my third time back. It's very nice. Uh, after that introduction, I'm afraid everything else is going to be a bit of a letdown. But I hope that you'll bear with me while we talk about, um, whoa, goal, see, we already changed things. Yeah. Let's go back to the slide. Christian missions and multiple modernities. I'm awfully proud of this PowerPoint template, so I want to see you. <laughs> cool things there. We're going to look at the different ways in which non-Christian, uh, non-Western cultures engage modernity and how they have changed and how those particularly have affected Christian mission, which means we're going to do a little history tour of Christian mission. And history really is my field. I did my PhD in history at the University of Malaya in Malaysia, focusing on Christian missions to Muslims in Southeast Asia and some of what that means. We're going to particularly emphasize the way in which it says, oh, these challenges affect training and preparation of persons wanting to be engaged in mission. Well, I may not talk about that so much after all. Um, and we're also going to understand that we're moving, I hope we'll understand, we're moving from a dynamic world in which we live into a dynamic world outside of us, that nothing is sitting still. And so let's get right into it. Early modern missions, in the, and we're going to randomly choose the 19th century, we say the 18th century, mission was conceptualized, or Christian mission was conceptualized as a linear process in which the gospel was carried to people who had never heard it. So the gospel was something that Christians in Christendom had, and it was delivered by boat, like other things, um, to people who didn't have it. That kind of process was based on some basic assumptions. Right? and that everybody pretty much agreed on it. It particularly in that Protestant mission circles was understood to mean that there was a gospel that was made up of ideas that could be conveyed verbally, could be proclaimed, certain things. Jesus is the Christ, right? Christ will come again. You are a sinner. Take your pick. The message was understood to address a universal human need, and that it was a human need that was universally felt. In other words, the assumption of missionaries was they would go into a different place, a different culture, a different people, and 
those people would be ready to hear the gospel. They would know that they needed that message. Okay. So different cultures were merely different kinds of clothing on people who were basically all alike in their human aspirations, including their religious aspirations. So it's what I call the gospel as a Barbie doll. Um, you will see the Southern Belle Barbie up in the left-hand corner. You will see the Japanese Barbie in the lower corner. You will see African Barbie, Brazilian Barbie, and my favorite, Chinese Empress Barbie. Um, a little bit of hair color, a little blackening of the skin, a change of costume, and you've done everything that needs to be done, right? Culture is just the clothing. But missionaries began to have a problem. They began to realize in the 19th century in particular that it wasn't going to be nearly that easy. And one of the places where this centered is an area where I did some of my academic study, and it was the problem of translation. How do you translate the Bible? Because these Protestants believed you should put the Bible in people's hands. How do you translate the Bible from a European language to a non-European language? And when they asked that question, they began to have a problem. You couldn't draw a straight line from a European concept to a verbal expression in another language. It turned out to be impossible. It turned out to be, at the very best, very difficult. But oftentimes it was impossible. And I'll just give you a few examples of this. There is no word in Arabic that has the same meaning of sin in English or hamartia in New Testament Greek. Arabic's a Semitic language. And the, all of the sort of freight of meanings in the King James Bible of sin simply don't move easily into a single word or conceptual word in Arabic. Um, it's hard even to find an, a word in Arabic that has an overlapping semantic field, meaning where at least part of the meaning of the word in Arabic overlaps with part of the meaning of sin in English or hamartia in Greek. There's no word in Chinese that has the same meaning as God in English or deus in Latin or theos in Greek. Indeed, um, a couple of recent works have argued pretty strongly that the word God in English doesn't have a lot in common with theos in Greek. Okay? Um, and an interesting study, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, is, is a book by uh, Groninger called God's Just Punishment, which deals with the doctrine of atonement and whether it really could have, whether a, a modern evangelical American doctrine of the atonement would have made any cultural sense to the first disciples? That's a good question. Something to think about anyway. Um, in any case, at least with Chinese, up until today, the Chinese Christian community hasn't settled this issue of God, and there are two different Chinese Bibles, and they use two different words for God. One Shang-Ti and one Shen. Um, and it's still irresolved, it's still unresolved, because Chinese had no word for God. Um, a word that I worked with a lot when I was involved on the new translation of the Malay Bible was the problem of saying in the Malay language, let there be, as in let there be light, okay? There's no verbal equivalent in Malay for let there be. Um, the, the Malay languages assume that everything always was and always will be. Nothing comes into being. It just changes its form. So they actually have a word to be, adala. But even this verb to be is hardly ever used. The more common word is it appears to be. So you wouldn't say, this is my friend. You would say, this appears to be my friend. <laughs> because the assumption underlying it is that all of reality is appearances, right? Constantly shifting and changing. So boy, did we have arguments about let there be light. Because light in Malay doesn't come into existence. It shines, it glitters, it twinkles, it flows. It trickles down like a brook. There's a lot of different things that light can do. It just never starts. <laughs> um, and if you don't say, let there be light in Malay, have you lost the whole doctrine of creation out of nothing? Right? God says, let it be. And yet that expression is almost impossible in Malay. What do you do? So people began to become, and this is very basic, I know, but it helps us work up to things. People began to become conscious of culture. They became conscious that culture was not just a clothing that was worn over human beings that were all the same everywhere, that had the same needs and aspirations. That culture was, at the very least, a map of reality in which each person lived and that the maps were very different. Now, we would say in sort of modern culture studies that it's a much deeper problem than even that. 
that the culture makes the human as the human lives in the culture. And you can't disentangle them at all. But for a moment, we're going to take an almost naive view of culture as a map. And that each culture provides us a map and an orientation within that map, a direction that we should move, so we know the landscape, we know where to go, we know what to do. But missionaries by the end of the 19th century were quite conscious that the maps were very different. Sometimes they were sort of similar, and if you did some work, you could make them line up so that your map matched another person's map and you could talk to them. Other cases, they were enormously different. So I just want to show you a couple of maps, and let's see if um, this will help us think about this. Uh, here's two of my favorite maps of San Antonio. San Antonio, Texas is one of my favorite cities. And these are maps of the river walk in San Antonio. Um, now you can see there's one on the upper right-hand corner, there's one on the left. Uh, they're clearly not identical. Can anybody tell me what's different about them? What's, what's different about the two maps? Yeah? They're oriented differently, right? For some bizarre reason, one's oriented north-south and one's oriented east-west, okay? Otherwise, they look pretty much the same, but there's one major difference that if you look closely, you'll see that could be critically important to a cultural interpreter here. It may be difficult from a distance. Yeah? They're scaled a little bit differently. Anything else? Yeah? One looks uh, focused on the water and one looks focused on the roads. That's right. One has got a lot more of the roads. One has a lot more of the water. Anything else? Yes? Yep, one marks a certain set of landmarks, another different set, yes? Right. The map on the left shows all the disability access to the river. The river's lower than the city. So if you were a disabled person, map on the upper right, worthless, you can't even get to the river. Right? If you're a disabled per person, no matter how it's oriented, the map on the left makes a difference. And that's a very small thing, right? And yet, if you weren't cognizant of the difference in the maps and the different ways that the maps were used, right, you might have some communication issues. Uh, we had an associate dean at our, at our university, and I used to have to go to meetings with her, and she usually liked someone to walk with her. Uh, she had uh, MS, a little older than me, uh, so she got around in a wheelchair. Well, one of the first things I learned is everywhere she went on campus, she took a different route than I did. Everywhere because her whole world was mapped around where there were no stairs to go up, right? Where you get to elevators. Um, even once I knew that, she could move faster than I could. <laughs> okay, so those were like easy maps. What about these two maps? Now, what do these maps have in common? Or can you even tell what kind of maps they are? Well, they are maps of the same area. It's just that the map on the left is a map of all the different soil types around San Antonio, okay? And the map on the right is an infrared map of the city. So in essence, it's a map of the temperature of the air above the soil. Now, what would it be like if you were in possession of this map and you were talking to someone in possession of this map and you're trying to tell them how to get someplace? What'd you go? Okay, well, you go, go north from the brown area until you move into the yellow area. And they're going, I got no brown and I got no yellow. I got green and pink. Well, you see the difference, right? So missionaries became cognizant that these, these maps were very different in each different culture. Sometimes a little bit different. You could do a little reorientation and talk to people. Sometimes unbelievably different so that communication might appear to go on, but it was often strained and, and things were misunderstood. But in a way, at the same time that missionaries were beginning to gain that kind of cultural knowledge, and they were going to bring that into the first great missionary conference of 1910, something else was happening that was going to make that knowledge in some ways not particularly necessary, at least for some missionaries. Because by the middle to late 19th century, Christian missionaries, although they'd begun to understand the complexities of the cultures, they also had begun to believe that their modern culture, and they were starting to use that term, that we were modern, that that modern culture was the best, most useful map of reality. It was the civilized map of reality. 
And so what had begun with a communication problem, how do I communicate cross-culturally, begins to become a problem of how do I get people to all use my map, right? I'm not going to speak to people with a different map. I'm just going to tell them, here is the map, and you're going to use it. So they didn't just deliver the gospel in a new cultural clothing. They may not have even tried to translate it into terms that could be understood in a different culture. They set about to make the cultures of the world modern, and one of the ways they did it was by creating modern institutions that should belong to any modern civilization. Schools, hospitals, orphanages, agricultural stations, printing presses, and so on. Um, now, there were different, I want to say first, missionaries didn't always agree on this. There were certainly missionaries, one I studied named William Shelabir, who believed deeply in the project of translation and who had growing and more sophisticated understandings of cultural difference the need to speak into that cultural difference, to establish dialogue, okay? But as, and William Shelabir was one of the early translators of the Bible into Malay, okay, for example. But for every William Shelabir, there was his bishop, James Thoburn, who wrote him a letter and said, I do not know why we are wasting our time translating the vigorous manly gospel in English into the effeminate and effete oriental languages. Surely it will result in a loss of vigor. <laughs> what, jo what Thoburn didn't like, Thoburn had lived all his life in India, he couldn't stand squiggly letters. It always reminded him of his mother's handwriting, you know? Um, so he, apparently he not only wanted the King James Version, he wanted it in block text, maybe all capitals or something. Okay, so but quite apart from gender, <laughs> issues, which Thoburn apparently had some. Um, this was a sentiment that was arising more and more in the late 19th and early 20th century, that somehow the real gospel message was attached to a European civilization, and that European civilization had its own dynamic but complete culture, right, and that it really represented where humanity was going. And that the job was not going to be, in fact, to know all these other maps and somehow dis do this complicated business of translating from one map to another. It was going to simply be to make Europeans so that everybody could have the same modern map. Airport, highways, right? It's going to work for everybody. By the late 19th century, missionaries felt a sense of inevitability, in fact, in this work. The whole world, in their view, was moving towards having the same map, a modern map. Eventually the whole world would be motivated through evangelistic work to move toward the reign of God. And so we get this great refrain from the hymn, the darkness shall turn to dawning, the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. A kingdom in which you would have modern Christians. Okay? Wang Chu Wan, the first Chinese Malaysian Christian to fly an airplane. Uh, this was published in many a missionary journal to show how far the Chinese Christian community had come in Malaysia. They're flying an airplane. Or this picture of the Methodist press in Singapore with a Javanese Christian compositor sitting at a linotype machine. This was one of a whole series that were sent back to the United States to raise money showing how the Christian community in Singapore had become thoroughly modern. Right? Um, the guy that published all this, by the way, uh, interesting guy. His name was W.T. Cherry. He had to retire early because he had a habit of chucking these workers out the second story window and the British colonial government could only protect him so long before there came a serious court case and he retired suddenly to the United States. Um, uh, he believed in modern so much that he didn't like having people who talked back to him. Um, not sure how that worked. And yet Almost as soon as this kind of mission idea reached its heyday, it began to fall apart. And it began to fall apart for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, there was world wars, World War I and World War II. There was rampant consumerism that arose in the early part of the 20th century, the excesses of the United States in the 20s and the Europe in the 20s. There was the Great Depression that came in which vast numbers of people were unemployed and starving in the West, right? Not in the poor, benighted countries outside the West. There was the Holocaust. There was the message to the world that modern wasn't necessarily civilized, 
modern could still be utterly barbaric. One of the places that this, this began to be attacked, and there's a, there's a lovely book called uh, David and Four Goliaths. Uh, it was by an Indian um, head of school in Malaysia critiquing the Methodist school system. The Methodist school system was the largest single school system in Malaysia and Singapore. A similar system was built in the Gold Coast back then, what is modern day Ghana, in Africa. And one of the things that this head of school employed by the Methodist church wrote was, he said, our schools have become an inane negative. We teach everything modern and nothing spiritual. Right? All we do is teach them science and math and reading but we give them nothing for their hearts. And he ends by saying, so unfortunately, we've turned them into Europeans. Okay. Secondly, ending this myth is the world, the so-called Western world, was divided, divided in its vision. You have capitalism versus communism, especially after the Second World War. So the so-called modern world is divided into two antagonistic ideologies. Christianity in the West becomes divided as well. The least of these, or the biggest of these divisions, because many smaller ones came about, fundamentalists versus liberals versus Pentecostal Christianity eventually arising, and, and by the way, divisions within them, of course. But Christianity no longer presented a united face to the world. In fact, it seemed like you had multiple Christianities within the old Christian world. And so the vision of worldwide Christianity begins to fail, not the least because one of the lessons of the first part of the 19th, last part of the 19th century at which it was really believed that in a single generation every single person would become Christian to after World War II is a lot of people didn't become Christian. China did not convert in vast numbers. India did not convert in vast numbers. The Muslim world did not fall to Christ. And it meant there needed to be kind of a serious reevaluation, right? The, whole, the project of delivering to the world a modern map, which everyone would acquiesce to because everybody had the same set of needs and needed that map, didn't work. And so the myth of the modern world being the end of all things begins to take over. And in fact, we discover, oh, we'll have to read you a poem. Anybody doing literature? Okay. Well, I try to be a little literary once in a while. So I'm going to read you a poem that actually comes from the very first part of this period uh, the period around when World War I is beginning to shake modernity. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming... Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of the spiritus mundi troubles my sight. A waste of desert sand, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs while all about it wind shadows of the indignant winter birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. Well, uh, William Butler Yeats, um, classic poem of the destructive end of the modern myth. And what comes about in its stead? Multiple modernities. Rudolf Bultmann, the great demythologizer, had thought in the 30s and 40s and 50s that anyone with access to modern education and technology would eventually reject all of those myths of pre-modern society. They would just say no to that nonsense. Okay? Yet in the last half of the 20th century, we find that this hasn't happened. Even in Europe and in the US, people can use electricity and still believe in gods and spirits. People can design, build, and drive cars that run on gasoline and yet not believe the geological theories that explain why oil is in the ground. They can believe that God injected it into the ground. Okay? Western modernity turns out to be not inevitable. There are other possibilities, and we see them around them, uh, around us. I'm, I'm a big fan of Mary Chapin Carpenter. I know that places me in a certain generation. Um, 
And she's got all these songs about my heaven and angels on the dashboard of her truck and all of this stuff. I mean, it's all very new agey, right? But there's more to it than that. In Singapore, we have a good friend, an old friend of our family. She's got a PhD from Edinburgh in chemistry, as does her husband. She works in an important office for IBM designing next generation materials. And yet, if she has a problem with her parents-in-law, she goes to the temple of Kuan Yin and prays to the goddess of mercy for help and doesn't see a great disconnect between these two different things. Okay. You can think of a woman, an American woman in a certain situation, would just get a divorce, which she wouldn't go to Kuan Yin, right? But there's a whole different understanding of filial piety, of human obligations, that run through this woman's mind and her understanding of where she fits into a world of help and care that American women would not share. They would be modern, but in different ways. The question of what are we in bondage to? The missionaries assumed that everybody felt guilty because everybody had sinned, right? Well, it turns out that not everybody thinks they've sinned and a lot of people don't think they feel guilty. Okay. In fact, I will tell you a little story about conversion and I'll let you chew on this for a while. It has many different resonances and it will give you some, some pause for thought, I hope, at least. I know an elderly gentleman, he passed away in the year 2004. Before he passed away in Kuala Lumpur, he wrote a book called My Witness on God's Calling. He was an old Chinese gentleman of the most Chinese gentlemanly type. He had been the headmaster of a Chinese school. He taught Chinese literature. Um, he'd also been educated in England. He wrote fluent English, so he published the book on facing pages in Chinese and English. And he tells the story of how he becomes a Christian, right? Because all his children had converted to Christianity, and they were inviting him to become a Christian, saying, Daddy, you need to become a Christian, all of this. And he went to church faithfully to Wesley Methodist Church every Sunday, but he didn't want to become a Christian because if he became a Christian, he would have to give up the rights of filial piety to his dead Buddhist mother. As a Christian, he could no longer go to her grave and make offerings to her dead spirit, right? But he finally feels he's getting close to the end of his life. It's important for him. He wants to be in heaven with his own children. And so he goes to his mother's grave and he takes a, peri a pair of divining blocks. He burns a set of jaw sticks several times to inv invoke the spirit of his mother. And then he takes the divining blocks and he asks the question, Mother, may I become a Christian? Okay? And then he throws them down. And depending on the way they land, the answer can be yes, no, or maybe. Okay? He asks the question seven times. Seven times the answer comes up yes. And so with his dead mother's blessing, he's baptized as a Christian and never goes back to her grave. Okay? Now clearly, his world is put together a little differently than a lot of our worlds, right? And he wrote this up in a book because he didn't see that there was any real problem with this. Now, I used to give my students in Malaysia fits and starts, but that was good for them, okay? Modernity, as it turns out, is a kind of a moving target. Look at our own society. We have, we've got a television show around guys that detect stuff with ghosts, Right? They come around like it always filmed in infrared light and, and, and see things or something like this. When Ghostbusters came out when I was much younger, like in your age, we all thought that that was funny because it was so stupid. Well, now it's science, apparently, some kind. Uh, people watch a television about, show about an angel that comes down to earth, touched by an angel. Okay? We have votive, votive candles and Buddhist shrines side by side in the supermarket, at least in Texas we do because it turns out that on a, on, a, on a sort of a food culture world, Latinos, Vietnamese, Indians, all share a lot of common interests. And so all of their particular forms of devotion are sold along their particular forms of spice, okay? We've cut our generations up into the boomers, the me generations, the Gen Xers, the Gen Yers, and et cetera. Preachers of the gospel find that they have to treat contemporary American and European culture as post-Christian and post-modern in other words, what we have happening today is we have culture studies, anthropological studies of American culture by generation and by demographic in order to effectively address the gospel to those generations and demographics. We're studying American culture the same way we used to study Chinese culture because we can no longer assume 
that there is a seamless world of communication in which a unified gospel can be presented. We live, in fact, in a time of multiple modernities. And what about beyond the West? Well, missionaries encounter the same plural complex reality beyond the West of multiple modernities. It turns out that modernity is not a packaged worldview that involves science, technological progress, modern state and social organizations, and individualism. It turns out that modern day modernity seems to be all of the different ways that people construct an identity under the stress of globalization. It involves an increasing ability to manipulate and control natural forces, which we have in spades, alongside a feeling that these forces are almost beyond human comprehension. So we have something like, to give you a good Texas example, um, on one day, we'll turn on the TV and discover that we're all tuned into the weather and concerns about whether climate change has resulted in the dry weather that we have, a record drought that results in bushfires everywhere, okay? And our governor is consulting the scientists on when rain will come, and the next day, he's holding a 12,000-person prayer rally to pray for rain, okay? Two different days, two different, completely different approaches to the question of how are we going to get some water on our dry land all held in one person who apparently, along with a lot of other people, doesn't have any problem fitting both those things in the same head. Okay. It's a little bit like the Mad Hatter, I believe 12 impossible things before breakfast. Uh, the globalization of forms of self-expression. All kinds of self-expression are now traveling worldwide from a variety of cultures into a variety of cultures and thus new possibilities for self-understanding. As I gain from other cultures new forms of self-expression, I don't have it for you because we don't have time for it, but there's a lovely album I bought in Kuala Lumpur by Mahir Zain. He is a Muslim rhythm and blues devotional singer. He sings entirely in English with only Arabic choruses, okay? And so when you first look at him and listen to him, you go, okay, Muslim, doing a little R&B, a little Detroit sound, that's fine, in English, because he doesn't speak Arabic. And then you realize he's Swedish. <laughs> but his grandparents were Pakistanis who migrated to Sweden. So his mother's Swedish, his dad's Pakistani, he's singing English language rhythm and blues. Muslim devotional music. Oh, whoa. Well, here's a guy who's found in this globalized world a whole set of resources for expressing his religious sentiments. Okay. Now, I happen to collect Muslim devotional music. I showed this to some of my younger Muslim friends on campus, and they came up with 20 more albums like this. Unbelievable. There's a whole market of this stuff. It's just that I don't shop in the stores where it's sold. Okay. But you'll find the same thing. One of the things we have in Dallas, we probably L.A., at least down the road here, you certainly have 20 versions of this. We have an immigrant Korean church that has a breakdance hip-hop praise group. So it's all Koreans doing breakdancing to hip-hop praise music in worship. Don't you know their grandparents are rolling over in the grave? And yet, they have found some form of expression of themselves particularly suited to the complex cultural context in which they live. The globalization of forms of self-expression gives these new understandings. And then finally, you have the globalization of new possibilities of human living through economic and educational opportunities. Vast numbers of migrants moving around the world, finding new ways to live, and sort of charting those out. I happen to live in a neighborhood now that has very, very large numbers of Vietnamese, Burmese refugees. Okay? Um, it happens, my wife is ethnic Chinese. Um, well, let's just use my family as an example. Okay? My wife is ethnic Chinese from Malaysia. We lived there for seven years. Our children were born and raised in Malaysia, Singapore, and Vienna. So now we've got my wife and I with, with the American half of the family and the Chinese half of the family. My son, who is kind of an Asianized, Euro trash, American citizen, but he's married to a Croatian girl. They're living with us right now. So we've got four cultures under one roof. My daughter works in Vienna where she lives with her Jewish-Austrian boyfriend. Now, this may sound a little bit, this is a pretty wide range of cultures, but that is increasingly the norm, not the exception, with people discovering who they are. She just called me the other day, by the way, 
to say how much pressure she is on, uh, how much pressure she's feeling from her, her uh, partner's father to convert to Judaism because he only wants to have Jewish grandchildren. It has to be the mother, right? And so she's going, yeah, I hate going over there for Rosh Hashanah. He's going to be on me again about converting. I said, has he put any pressure on you about marrying like your mom and I? Oh, no, he doesn't care about that. He just wants me to convert. Okay. It's, it's hard on my wife, I just want to tell you. I'm American. I can live with a lot of flexibility. So let's look at modern religion. Let's look at modern religion. Um, here we have a girl in China offering devotions. This was taken two years ago in Beijing. This is an interesting religious shrine, isn't it? There's three pillars and a giant teapot in the back. And I say a giant teapot because it, it's about 60 feet tall. This is one of several objects of religious devotion of a cult that recently grew up in Malaysia that believes in the unity of all religions around drinking tea. Okay? And the guy in the middle of the Malaysian jungle built a kind of a theme park to this theme with the teapot being the central deal. He had hundreds and hundreds and then thousands and ten thousands of pilgrims that came to listen to him talk until the Malaysian government declare, declared him either a Muslim heretic or something. They couldn't quite figure out whether he was a Muslim heretic or just not a Muslim at all. They put him in jail. Um, they have trouble with diversity. Or here's one of my favorites. Um, you probably know of the Ramayana epic. It's central to Hinduism. Well, Deepak Chakra and Virgin Comics have put out a series of manga-style comics of the Ramayana epic. So here we have the Ramayana epic, the great story of gods and demons and stuff in comic book form. Uh, that's the cover. Deepak Chakra's Ramayana, 3092 AD. There was a whole series under that one. Then there was another series called Ramayana Reloaded. Um, uh, I, have, I have quite a large number of them. Lone Star Comics helped me acquire them. Um, but it's amazing. It's page after page of this stuff, and it, it features all the things a modern comic needs to have, angst-filled heroes who are unsure of their identity and do the girl really love me, goddesses that dress like Captain America. Or, I mean, they're goddesses. What can I say? Um, I was just telling Charles, when I saw this, I thought how cool it would be to teach Asian religions with comic books and in no time at all, I found that you can, in fact, get a comic book version of every one of the major world religious primary sources. The Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the life of the Buddha in six volumes as a Japanese manga. An artist in Taiwan who's done all of the Buddha's sutras, the Tao Te Ching, etc. All of this modernized in comic book form. And by the way, you will find the Jesus mangas. Just go look, okay? You want to see Jesus whip some demon ass, man. <laughs> it's right there. Okay. What does this mean for mission? We've got this, this globalized world. I'm, it sounds all very confusing, but it's not really confusing. Actually, the interesting thing is through the eyes of missionaries, it's just particular. It's the beginning of recognizing that there are many modernities, Right? There's many ways in which modernity is engaged and addressed. And one of the ways we could see this was at Cape Town 2010, the third of the great Lausanne conferences. Um, on one hand, you could see at Cape Town 2010 things falling apart. The old generation that had dominated the Lausanne conferences was gone. Um, it was under new leadership, um, a man named Birdsell. Uh, I actually wrote about this and published a journal article, and then I was supposed to meet a guy at the State Department named Judson Birdsell, and I didn't quite put two and two together till I sat down with him, and he said, and I asked him, we were talking mission stuff and some things that he does in the State Department, and um, he said, well, you probably know my dad, Richard Birdsell. I said, as in the head of the Lausanne group, and he goes, yeah, yeah, that's him. And I'm going, I hope you hadn't read my article. I just, and did I say anything bad? That's the only thing. Did I say anything bad? That's a good lesson to remember when you're writing for publication. You never know who you're going to meet. I'll tell one other story like that. We had a crazy guy talk to my class on Islam. Well, he wasn't crazy, but he presented a lot of bizarre ideas. An older man. Um, the, the basic idea was, he said, if you, if you made a scale like this, X, Y, okay, 
and X is the number of surahs in the Quran, chapters in the Quran, and Y is the number of times that a word appears in the surah. So, so you can graph it, like, so you take the name for Jesus, Isa, right? So you go surah one, six times, surah two, four times, surah three, no times, etc. You graph the dots, then you convert both the scales to logarithmic scales. So it's now a dual logarithmic scale, XY graph. You connect the dots and they'll spell the word that it was, Jesus or whatever, Miriam or whatever. Okay? Now, he was very excited about this and he had many graphs to show my students to prove the miracle of the Quran. But of course, my students were going, Arabic's a squiggly language. You know, it's pretty easy to make those dots join up to anything you want. Um, anyway, he didn't come across very well. So I talked to a friend of mine who's a Muslim leader in Dallas named Mohammed Ali Biari, and I said, um, hey, Mohammed, there's this guy out there who's doing this thing, and I'm not sure it's great for Muslim-Christian relations, you know, because kind of wacko, you know. And Mohammed goes, well, who is he? You know, we try to keep track of these people and talk to him. I said, well, it's a guy named Nagib Ali Biari, same last name as yours. And he goes, oh, that's my dad. And I'm going, whoa. <laughs> foot in mouth, foot in mouth. Um, but, of course, he said, you know, yeah, I've been talking to dad about this for years, you know, but this is dad's project. He's excited about it. And that's, but that says something. Here's, here's a Muslim trying to express his understanding of the miraculousness of the Quran in what thoroughly modern terms, right? It can be graphed on a dual logarithmic scale. It's an engineering approach to scripture. Okay. Why? Because he's an engineer, right? Okay. Mission Cape Town, 2010 things begin to fall apart. There were more than 17 different sections about how missions can address, and I'm only listed a few of them here, oral cultures, megacities, migration, mission populations and diaspora, women under oppression, populations threatened by war, populations threatened by drought, unemployed youth, illiterate populations, that's interesting. Mission to illiterate populations is different than mission to oral culture populations, right? And then of course you get missions to migrants, migrants and megacities, right? Diaspora and megacities. The whole world, uh, the conceptualization of mission is no longer humans in need of sin, a gospel here, but is this vast array of human needs, each of which represents a different way in which modernity has intersected these people's lives and in which they're constructing a vision of who they are. And of course, this means a vast profusion of Christian responses to the gospel new ways of being Christian in and before the world. And so you had dozens of workshops on how you approach these things. And of course, it was represented by 200 or more mission agencies from every country in the world, ranging from three missions, missionaries to more than 2,000. It's a vast range. Something that would have really been inconceivable back in the days in 1910, 100 years earlier, when in Edinburgh, the call needed to go out to about 250 people and that would cover everybody. Not everybody in the world, but everybody who needed to know and could pass it on. A Pew survey of world evangelical leaders was taken at Cape Town in 1910. You can look it up online. But it also shows some of the fracturing in the evangelical community. Beliefs about creation in the end times. So the question was asked, humans have existed in their present form since the beginning of time. 47% agree. Evolution has occurred guided by God. 41% agree. Evolution has occurred solely by natural processes, 3% of evangelicals. Surely that would have been 0% only 20 years ago. Okay? In fact, you probably couldn't have imagined the split in the first two. Jesus will definitely return in the own lifetime. 8% said yes. Jesus will probably return in his own lifetime. 44% said yes. Jesus probably will not return in our own lifetime. 37% said yes. Jesus will definitely not return in our own lifetime. 2% of the people are worried about Jesus coming back, and they're hoping that it won't be in their lifetime. Um, now, I grew up in the shadow of Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas, and I tell you, we were, we were totally in that very first one. If he's not back by 1984, he's late, okay? Um, yes, I, I read Hal Lindsey as a youth. The rapture of the church will take place before the Great Tribulation, 61% say yes, premillennialist. End times will not occur in exactly this way, 32% say yes. Things come together things do fall apart. Do things come together? It's easy to catalog our differences, human and Christian, yet we recognize each other somehow as being Christian. That's the interesting thing for all this cultural siloing. We talk to each other. My wife, my daughter-in-law, well, not so much my daughter-in-law, my son, my daughter, the Jewish boyfriend, 
Interestingly enough, for all our cultural difference, we communicate. For all our linguistic difference, we communicate. Sometimes in bad German, sometimes in bad English, sometimes in bad Malay, frequently in bad Chinese. Okay? I can speak 100 words of Chinese. I can get in deep trouble in Chinese. I can get in deep trouble. You know how close the words for ask and kiss are in Chinese? One is one, and one is one. Okay? It's a little different. I can't tell you how many times I've approached someone to say, I need to ask a question. I've said, can I kiss you? <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> yeah. Well, the difference between horse and mother is the difference between ma and ma. Yeah, that can go, that can go wrong, wrong on you, too. Okay. So we recognize each other, even as Christians, across these vast divides, we recognize each other. All those thousands of people, more than 10,000 people who went to Cape Town, Disagreed about a billion different things, and yet they all knew they were Christians. They somehow did agree on that. Okay? We communicate, and interestingly enough, evangelistic mission continues to be effective. People do continue to convert to Jesus Christ. Now, there's not the inevitability there was thought there would be 100 years ago, and yet it's also not impossible. It seems to be that somehow the message for all of the blundering and misunderstanding and multiple forms of modernity gets across. So I think we still do not have quite a theology of Christian unity and life at mission to explain these things, but I'm going to suggest with a last poem that there may be some answers. This poem was written around the turn of the last century, 110 years ago, um, and it was dealing with India, England at a time of rapid social change and industrialization. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, O oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and ah bright wings. Like a mother hen, that is how it all comes together. Thank you all very much.